Less than two months ago, on the 19th of August, the barbaric pictures of American journalist Jim Foley dressed in orange kneeling before a masked jihadi flashed across the world. An online video of the barbaric beheading of the New Hampshire native followed as his Islamic State captures showed the first of what has been three medieval-style executions to date. Today, the entire world is appalled by the brutal murder of Jim Foley by the terrorist group ISIL. Jim was a journalist, a son, a brother, and a friend. Jim was taken from us in an act of violence that shocks the conscience of the entire world. Jim Foley's family's devastation is beyond words, and uh, though through the pain, they are determined to remember their son and brother for the work he has done, rather than for the manner of his death. Jim's parents have flown into Ireland, especially to remember their son in a more positive way tonight. So would you please welcome John and Diane Foley. You're so welcome. Thank nice to see you, both. So, what I'd like to do, if I may, is to talk to you about young Jim. Okay. Uh, the Jim you remember uh, in the house, being a boy. Tell me a little bit about him. Well, Jim was a joy from the beginning. He really? was always, he had a smile, he loved to read and make believe, Ryan. So he loved to um, pretend he was all kinds of things, all over the world. Yeah. It was from Davy Crockett to a pirate. You know? right. <laughs> yeah, he also locked his sister in a bedroom to have a party one time. <laughs> <laughs> he did that too. He had a good time. So he, he was, enjoyed life. Okay, so he was, he was normal in that sense. He did the yes. things. Yeah, that, he wasn't that, a saint. Okay, no. he wasn't a saint. Well, that's no. nice to say. No. He, when he got older, he was obviously interested in, in photojournalism, and, and, and yet he was, as we, we spoke yesterday, we, we had, I had the pleasure of meeting you both yesterday, and I was struck by how he seemed to combine both an interest in the world uh, be it through photo, photo, photography, but also a humanitarian streak. He, he combined the two, is that oh, right? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. In what way? Well, I think he started out as a friend, Ryan. He yeah. was always a good friend. He, um, great listener, full of fun. So, um, and he treasured his friendships, didn't he? Yeah. Huh? He worked very hard at being a friend. He was a very active listener. Yeah. And um, he, he, he listened to... Um, a story with the idea that he wanted to help if help was needed yeah. um, and um, that's the way he proceeded with his life. Mm. How did he end up in Libya at that time? Well, that was um, that was once he decided to become yeah. a journalist. Um, before that, um, he had done quite a bit of teaching, Ryan. He taught um, with what, a program we have called Teach for America for children in um, inner cities, poor children, you know. Um, and he had done that for a number of years in Phoenix, Chicago, mm -hmm. and Massachusetts. But he also loved to write. So I think he saw journalism as a way to combine his love for people yes. and their stories with his um, joy of writing, okay. you know. So, and then the photography kind of came along. He right. wanted. Yeah, he, he went just, to uh, it, the Medill you know, University College of Journalism. And, yes. Um, he told us at that point that you weren't going to be able to have a photographer, so you had to learn learn both. Okay. So, um, at that point, he. Um, he completed the program, and then we really weren't sure what he wanted to do. And finally he told us that he was going to be a conflict journalist right. out of the blue and went to Iraq uh, with the Indiana National Guard and then went to Afghanistan and eventually got to Libya. Got to so, Libya, where he was, where he was captured, captured. Right. And, um, and held for 44 days? Exactly. Correct. Yeah. Um, how were you during that time? How difficult was it for you during... Oh, we thought, of course, it was horrible. We had no way, nothing to compare it to. We were just very frightened with, you know, we were, we just, it was like a nightmare, um, Ryan. It was, we just couldn't believe, you know, what was happening. However, at that time, we knew who had taken him, and we were able to find out essentially where he was, so we knew he was alive, for one thing, and, um... We prayed nonstop, um, yeah. and he did come home in 44 days. So in comparison to the last two years, it was nothing, really. It was, of you course, know, and, and, and but, we have a little footage of Jim at Medill. You mentioned Medill, John, talking to students. And you can see in the piece that we're, we're going to show with your permission. Of please. course. Um, your son 
um, as a natural communicator, um, interested in the world and talking about his experience. Let's share that with our viewers. Please, okay, thank you. Great. You have a close call or something, right? You need to really look at that, you know, that's pure luck that you didn't get killed there. Pure luck, you know? And you need to either change your behavior right there or you shouldn't be doing this because it's not worth your life. It's not worth seeing your mother, father, brother, and sister bawling and, and you know, you're worrying about your grandmother dying because you're in prison. It's not, it's not worth these things. You know, it's not worth your life, no matter what romantic ideal you have, no matter what ethic you think you have. Um, you know, it's, it's never worth that. He, he, Jim subsequently then announced he was going back, back to the Middle East at this stage. Um, and did you spend any time trying to tell him this was a bad idea? You're nodding, John. What did you say to him? Well, we asked him why. <laughs> sure. And um, um, Jim didn't didn't dwell on the day-to-day -day dangers, etc. Um, but he did tell us that this was his passion. That he really had made some commitments that he had to keep. Um, he was committed to telling stories of people who couldn't speak, and I think he was committed to people who were willing to fight and die to make their world a better place to live. And he was taken by the suffering, particularly of the children. I mean, that just... Jim loved children, and I think he just witnessed so much suffering in the hospitals there that he helped with some of the other journalists raise money to buy an ambulance. People were bringing um, wounded in trucks and the back seat of cars and carrying people. It was just, you know... and. The more suffering he saw, I think the more he felt compelled to be there to bring it to us. So off he went, right. determined Absolutely. to make a difference. Absolutely. And Absolutely. you obviously, what you, it was 2012, he's kidnapped again. Again, he couldn't probably, I don't know how you could fathom it. Yeah. Um, how did you hear about the kidnapping? Through a colleague, um, through a, a freelancer who was working. Um, it was the day after Thanksgiving and Jim had not called, so... We were kind of afraid because Jim was very good about calling on the holidays, very thoughtful person. He wanted to connect with family and we didn't hear from him all day. And then the next morning we got a phone call um, and they said Jim had not returned from um, his latest trip into Syria. You know. And when did you get confirmation that Jim was taken by? Well, it was pretty much then. They knew it. They knew. They knew because they were waiting at the border for him and they tried to call him and they just knew. Um, they, you know, it was pretty much confirmed. What did you think, John, when, when you heard that Jim was taken? Damn. Yeah. Not again. This can't happen again. What are the chances? <laughs> yeah. And, you know, I mean, we were just blown away and devastated. We can't do this again. And I think we all went through the initial anger stage. We were angry at Jim that he had done this, you know, and put us, is going to put us through this whole thing again. But after the anger subsided, we realized that, you know, Jim was there for what he thought were very important reasons mm -hmm. and that we, um, as parents, um, had and would continue to support him and the family came back together again and we started off to try to get him home again. But we were very frightened, Ryan, because we did not hear from him from the time he was captured um, until we, well, we never heard from him again. So Nothing. the last time we heard his voice was a week before his capture. And On TV. We never heard from him again. Yeah. And yet you've been able to piece together um, elements of his experience from people who were fortunate enough to be released, is that right? Yes. Mainly in the last year of his captivity, though. We know very little of the first year. So of that time, what was, tell me a little of the treatment Jim was, 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 was dealing with while there. What were you hearing back? Well, it's only recently that we really know how brutally he was treated. He was, uh, he was um, tortured and starved. I mean, he was, it was just, he barely made it through the first year, we hear. And, um, but I think the good thing is that slowly 
they gathered all the Western people they had um, captured. And, and I think for Jim, that had to be a solace because he was with other good people. And so together, I think that helped. I know it helped, Jim. We, we got uh, reports from his fellow released hostages that they were worked hard at staying sane. They gave lectures to one another. Um, Jim's specialty was history, and he'd, so he did history and English literature. Others did cooking. Um, some did sailing with their blankets. Um, um, one young man was a gymnast and taught, did, did the calisthenics, the, the fitness sort of yeah. things. Um, Jimmy's particular situation was difficult because as an American, he was, he was a whipping boy. And um, I, I think that he um, allowed that to happen to protect others. You he, think he offered himself in yeah, some way? He, he, they told us that he would negotiate with the guards to make sure they got enough food and you know, work with the other hostages to you know, dampen any anger or activity or you know, um, any, any kind of thinking or, or that would diminish their ability to stay together as a group. You know? it, it, we were, as we were talking yesterday, I was struck by the <laughs> fact that when he was a boy, he used to play a game called Risk. Oh, And then yes. in this awful oh, dark, yes. dark moment, Absolutely. there he was in some God knows yeah, where yeah. place in yeah. Syria. And what yeah. was he doing? They were playing Risk. On they, the ground. They, they were. With they, bits of whatever yes, they could find. Yeah, I think Jimmy drew the board out. And they used, to, they used to have tournaments, and they'd plan their strategy the day before the game. Right. And uh, I, I could just see him playing now, you know. One of the hostages uh, who was released to have... Uh, was, was, that, was in a position to recite a letter that your son, Jim, asked him to learn so that he could come to you and say, this is what your son wants to say to you. It was so beautiful, Ryan. Because Jim was one of the few hostages that never got a letter out. We never heard from Jim again since um, November of 2012. So um, that was difficult. I, ha I have a bit of the, the letter here. Do you? Wonderful. Would you like to read a bit of it, or would you like me to read a bit of it? Whichever, Ryan, is fine. Whichever. Do I'm you? happy to let you. If okay. It's your son's sure. words. Sure. Okay. It's, it, it, we just highlighted some parts of it we thought were very appropriate. Okay. And if you need help, I'll come and get you. <laughs> How about glasses? No, I'm sorry, I don't have glasses <laughs> with me. Go ahead, then. Dear family and friends, I remember going to the mall with Dad, a very long bike ride with Mom. I remember so many great family times that take me away from this prison. Dreams of family and friends take me away, and happiness fills my heart. Can you read it? Yep. I have been weak. I have had weak and strong days. We are so grateful when anyone is freed, but of course, going for our own freedom. We try to encourage each other and share our strength. Katie, so very proud of you. You're the strongest and best of us all. That's her little sister. Sure. His little sister. Mm -hmm. Think of you working so hard, helping people as a nurse. I am so glad we texted just before I was captured. I pray I can come to your wedding. Now I'm sounding like Grammy. Grammy, take your mm -hmm. medicine. Take walks and keep dancing. I plan to take you out to Margaritas when we get home. Stay strong because I'm going to need your help to reclaim my life. Jim. That took some strength to read that. Thank you very much for yeah. doing that for us because that was not an easy thing to do. Oh, Jim was very strong. We're so proud of him, Ryan. Yeah, I can understand. He, um, very, he was very courageous and he grew bigger. Um, in his captivity, we're very touched by how close they all became and how Jim was able to love even in that dark place. So. The, the, the captors, they, they made demands. They sent you an email or two and, and saying, we want this and we want that, and utterly unreasonable demands being made of you. Totally. Um, when did you realize it had reached the end game, the most awful? Point. You know, Ryan, I think, I think we were very naive. I, I, we were hopeful right to the end. Even when we received an email saying Jim would be the first to be killed, 
we thought, oh, at least they're in touch with us. We were so naive. Yeah. Um, we thought, oh, maybe now we can negotiate with them. Or, um, and then? It was on TV. Then came the TV. Yeah. How, how did you hear, can I ask you? Yeah, um, Diane was at home, and I was coming from someplace. I can't remember the moment. And a journalist called the home and was crying and asked Diane if she knew what was going on right. and told us that Jimmy had been right. beheaded. We heard from a journalist. Yeah. Jim had a lot of good friends in journalism, and they were all following very intently, trying to, you know, um, for any clues to bring Jim home. Um, President Obama called you. Later, yeah, a few um, days later. And your world had changed for all the wrong reasons. Right, right. How do you cope with hearing Whatever about the death of your son, the nature of it, the whole horror of it. How, how, do, you, how do you take that on, on Brian, board at all? Brian, he's free. You see it as freedom? He, he's free. Um, we had prayed, I had prayed for him to be set free. And I, I guess the Lord felt that was the only way he could be free. He, he was really um, needed to be out of that situation. And um, he's free. We're the ones that are struggling to deal with the loss because he was a light in our family. Of course. He, he lit up a room and, and uh, brought us much joy. Of course he did. Of course he did. And, and do you see it? Did you, did you have strong faith, John? Are you, are you struggling um, with it? Yeah, I struggle. I <laughs> yeah, struggle. Yeah. But I know that Jimmy's free. He couldn't, he couldn't have possibly tolerated the, jail, the beatings and the kickings and the whatever. Um, and there was no obvious way that we could find to get him out. So yeah. um, I know he's free. I know he's not in pain any longer. And that, um, that's a solace. It's comfort in it's that. It's a solace, yeah. I, I, I've just heard, it just been handed a piece to let me know that, uh, that in the last hour or so, they've heard reports that a fourth hostage has been yeah. executed uh, by Islamic State, which is desperately sad. His name was Alan Henning. He was a 47-year-old former taxi driver. He was kidnapped last December. I think Another innocent. Ryan. He was there to bring aid to the Syrians. He had um, left his family at Christmas to bring help. What, what do you make of, uh, of IS or ISIS or whatever they call themselves in a given week? What, how do you feel towards these people? You know, I mean, I, I... They hate us. They hate us. They hate us, Ryan. And that's where we feel that we're, we're um, that as a world community, we must come together in a big way. I mean, this is, um, it's frightening. Yeah. The hate, hate is frightening. Well, yeah. it's not a one country problem. It's yes. A, it's a world community problem, you know, and uh, um, they're the enemy right now, you know. Yeah. And, um, and it could be anyone. I mean, it could be a humanitarian worker, a journalist, driver. a tourist, yeah. anybody, yeah. you a know. A student in a foreign yeah. country. Yeah. Exactly. We, we need to come together as a world to try to figure out how to deal with these situations. Well, let's conclude our conversation on what could po possibly be an upbeat note and talk about the work you want to do. You're, you are, as I've said to you before, ambassadors for your son's legacy. Well, we're here in Jim's behalf, for well, sure. Well, why don't Ryan. you tell what, what are you going to do? How are you well, gonna... well, we want Jim to live on. Jim Good. had a lot left to do, Ryan. Sure. He had lived many lives in his 40 years, but he had so much to do. And he was very passionate about freedom, for one, freedom of the press. And we know he was, he was passionate about all youngsters getting an opportunity to learn. Yes. And um, we know he would have been very passionate about citizens who are unjustly captured, that they have an opportunity to be free. Okay. So we're, we've established um, the James... Um, w. Foley Legacy Foundation in hopes that his spirit can live on. Well, we wish you so well in your endeavors, and that it has not been easy for you to do what you do, but you do it with, with such an articulate dignity that uh, we can only stand back and say thank you for your time and wish well, you good well into the we future. We thank the Irish people. We have received so many prayers and cards from your country. Uh, it's just been very heartwarming. Well, you can expect many more after tonight. Thank you for your time and go well. Thank the you. Foley's Day, thank you. Thank you.